And so I had mentioned that you know, there's going to be standard whiteboard layout. This is how we tend to compartmentalize the whiteboard in this particular fashion. And the first up is mission planning cell objectives, slide please. Typically, one of the primary objectives is going to be to develop a plan. And you know, that would be an objective of the mission planning cell. And some implied objectives are going to be to develop a mission uh, coordination card or a cord card, as well as mission partner coordination as part of this. So those are, they tend to be implied objectives for the MPC uh, with a specified objective of developing the plan. Slide, please. Planning timelines, you know, they vary from mission planning cell to mission planning cell. In this particular case, you know, I, I use a notional time frame of uh, 10 hundred hours to scope the problem in 30 minutes, then moving to initial problem solving, then initial cord meeting at 12. Comp plan development uh, is going to be at 1300, 1400 uh, be contingency development, 45 minutes later cord card development, um, and then rock drill uh, script development. Uh, and then briefing, uh, you know, developing the brief, and then mission planning cell stop at 1600. So there's a lot of different ways to carve this up. That is one way. Slide, please. Mission planning milestones, some important uh, major muscle movements would be the mission breakout. So that's analyzing what the mission frag is, taking a look at what are the requirements. Uh, then there's going to be you know, plan development, the cord card a rock drill script, uh, the group review, which is where you're looking at the, uh, looking at the plan with the group and then you know, developing the team brief. Another part of the whiteboard layout is gonna be you know, who the major players are, what their positions are. In this particular case, it's gonna be the team leader, the tech lead, um, the security ops center, POC, Windows operator, and the infrastructure, and um, the uh, Wi-Fi operator. Uh, and if I didn't mention it before, this particular mission is a notional mission for a pen test um, uh, mission. So um, those leadership positions uh, make sense in that in that sense or in that context. Slide, please. Next up in the top right, typically you're going to have the classification of the brief itself in the facility that you're in. Now, uh, in this particular case, because it is unclassified and is a notional uh, pen testing. Um, uh, plan for a uh, like a red team, a commercial red team. Uh, confidential would be the classification they would use. Typically, what you're going to see is for on the DoD side, it's going to be you know, unclassified, you know, or CUI, and then uh, secret or top secret, or any caveats that might be applied. Slide, please. Next up is going to be the mission objectives. In this particular case, you're going to have the specified objectives of surveying the wireless vulnerabilities, gain and maintain. Um, the uh, access to the target network, maintaining robust logs, then egress from the network, and then clean up. Implied objectives are going to include, you know, limit the impact to the network, and then also to remain stealthy, so uh, not, to not be observed by the network administrators in this case. Slide, please. The uh, schema maneuver, uh, this schema maneuver for this notional mission would be you know, you got phase zero, phase one, two, and three, phase zero being prep, phase one being access and ingress, phase two being exfil, phase three egress. Uh, and the um, steps inside there would include doing your system checks, any network checks, surveying the wireless environment, begin spear phishing exercise, then establishing a foothold, you know, ingressing into the network. Uh, I, identifying any sensitive but unclassified information in this notional network, beginning exfil, end, ending data exfil, and then removing any tools or capabilities, and conduct the post-execution uh, cleanup and then egress. Slide, please. In this particular case, I did not identify any packages uh, that would be subordinate to the overall mission, but in certain large force executions, you might have multiple tactical um, packages that might be a part of the larger mission itself. And so in the bottom left-hand corner of this, of this whiteboard layout, you would see the package objectives listed here. Slide, please. So the meat of the mission is going to be largely in this space, uh, part of, in, the, in the mission planning workspace. 
This is where you're going to find the commander's intent, the desired end state, facts, assumptions, constraints, restraints, the targets, the terrain, and the impact. Um, slide. Next up, you know, this is where you know, when we start talking about mission, enemy, environment effects, you know, plans, phases, contingencies, uh, you know, contract, all of that. This is where we start to see so much of that come to life. So uh, next up, when we start you know, walking through you know, the enemy and the environment, we're going to talk about the adversary, who the actor is most dangerous, most likely, the intel gaps or adversary ops rhythms. We're also going to talk about the effects that we want to achieve as part of this mission, any, um, what the capabilities are of the, of, of the team itself, of the, you know, any limitations, any dependencies for those capabilities slide. We're also going to talk about the plan uh, in the, you know, as we walk through the scheme of maneuver, we're going to talk about what the triggers are to move from, phase, from one phase to the next. Triggers are often event-based or time-based. So at this time, we will do X. At, at this next time hack, we will do X. So, for instance, a good example would be, you know, we're going to start, you know, at you know, 1,200 hours or whatever that execution timeline looks like. Um, but other um, events might be event-based. So, one event-based trigger might include something along the lines of, once we get our first call back, we will do X. So, that would be an event-based trigger. Slide, please. In the... Far right hand side of the mission planning space, you're likely going to see requests for information. Uh, a standard rule of thumb is if you're going to make any assumptions in your planning, which assumptions are very important, um, other, you know, you, you're not going to have near perfect intel uh, for any mission. So you're often going to be scratching your head as a team thinking, okay, well, does the enemy have X as part of their capability you know, portfolio? Or, you know, what can we expect if under these conditions? You can have paralysis by analysis if you, you know, play the what if game all day long. So it, uh, to get around that, most folks are just going to, you know, most planners are just going to end up making assumptions. But a rule of thumb is if you're going to make an assumption, which assumptions are a critical part of the planning process, if you're going to make an assumption, you should do at least two things. One, submit an RFI. So let's not assume the enemy does or does not have capability X. Let's submit an RFI and find out if we know if intelligence can answer that question for us. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. So rule of thumb for an assumption, one, submit RFIs. Two, have a contingency in case that assumption proves incorrect. So if you assume the enemy does not have capability X, have a contingency in place uh, such that if you are conducting the mission and that the enemy does have that capability, how to address it. So uh, rule of thumb, if you're making an assumption, have an RF, submit an RFI for, th for that, and then two, uh, have a contingency in case the assumption proves incorrect. This part of the planning space is a good, uh, is a good spot for those RFIs that you submitted. Slide, please. Now, down in the bottom right-hand corner is one of the tricky little um, spots of the planning uh, of the planning space. So the parking lot. So I've seen that used in different ways. One way is, you know, say you've got somebody who's throwing out kind of crazy ideas or tends to um, put out, you know, take the team, you know, take the team off schedule or, you know, might not be uh, a productive, you know, not everything they say is, is, um, is productive towards the planning effort. The parking lot is a great spot for that. So you, you might say, hey, Major so-and-so, I appreciate you bringing up uh, the fact that you know, the enemy might have XYZ capability. We don't know that. But, you know, um, to keep us on schedule, you know, we'll put this in the parking lot. So we'll, you know, at the appropriate time, we'll, we'll circle back on that. The parking lot's a great spot to, um, to, uh, to place some, some of those discussions that might take the team off, uh, off their uh, task. Slide, please. Now, the way I've seen it is there's usually two sides to the whiteboard, uh, the front side and the back side, or two slides. Um, I just showed you slide one, slide two, the planning space. Uh, slide, please. 
would include MOEs and MOPs. That's your measured effectiveness, measured performance. Now, there's some art here. I talked about art and science. Part of the art of MOEs and MOPs is that even when you look inside JP50, there, there's no real hard and fast rules about the development of MOEs and MOPs. In fact, you could get 10 planners in, in, in the room, ask them, you know, what's, it, what's a good MOE, what's a good MOP in this context, and you might get 10 different answers. Here's some rules of thumb that I have heard in the last, you know, over, over my career. MOEs tend to be more qualitative in nature, and MOPs tend to be more quantitative in nature. So we've we've uh, dropped five hundred, you know, five hundred of a thousand ordinances. So quantitative in nature. Uh, MOE example, qualitative in nature, might be something along the lines of you know, adversary uh, recruitment efforts decreased you know, in this region, and more qualitative in nature. Another rule of thumb that I've learned you know, over the last couple of years is that MOEs tend to be more enemy focused and MOPs tend to be more uh, blue for focused. An example might be, you know, um, adversary, you know, we'll say ISIS, we'll give you know, an example, ISIS um, uh, numbers decreased in this region, uh, or, you know, ISIS is impacted in this way in this region as we look at, you know, are we doing the right things? And for MOPs, it might be more blue four focused. An example of that might be you know, we've conducted, you know, 50 of 100 offensive cyber operations missions. So it's, it's more about what the, what Blue 4 has done. So, well, the intent of MOEs and MOPs are meant to answer two key questions. MOEs, are we doing the right things to achieve our desired outcome? And are we doing things right? It tends to be more the and you know, the MOPs help you answer that question. Again, they're rules of thumb. These are not, it's not dogma. The intent is to just make sure that we're uh, getting closer to achieving the commander's desired end state. Slide, please. You're also likely to see contingencies and rock drill events inside this part of the planning space. So again, there's no hard and fast rule about how you lay it out. This just happens to be the template that you'll find in the US Cybercom uh, Tactical Mission Planning and Briefing Guide and Templates. But contingencies in this context for a pen testing mission might be, hey, the spear phishing messages are sent out, now what? You know, again, the rock drill events, it's meant to chair fly you know, the mission, so effective rock drills are gonna walk through the mission and the major muscle movements and then challenge the team members, you know, what do you do if this happens? And so um, what happens if, as part of the pen testing mission, advanced persistent threat actors are detected? Then what? You know, does your plan account for that? Does it, uh, what if the adversary does a password reset? You know, the adversary in this context is system administrators in a corporate network. What happens if your primary comms are disrupted? What happens if your capability um, is uh, not working as expected. What happens if you know your secondary comms are disrupted? What happens if there's a robust network posture? What happens if you know the um, there's some really savvy network administrators? What happens if you're discovered during the pen test? What happens if you lose your access? All of these things. These are contingencies that the plan should account for. And so it's a uh, it's good to walk through it multiple times to make sure that the the plan itself is very complete. What's your knock it off criteria, your ceasefire criteria, what's your mission abort criteria? What happens if there's an infrastructure failure? What hap you know, these are um, what happens if you come across illegal content? You know, you you don't want to be thinking through that as it's happening. You want to think about it ahead of time. Slide please. So we talk uh, when we talk about the the uh, contracts, the operational contracts, they tend to be in the form of uh, CACA, some people say CACA, but the uh, Criteria Authority Coordination, or I'm sorry, Communication and Action. So, um, 
you know, criteria would be foothold is established, the uh, authority would be you know, who's gonna make that call, the communication, the actual verbiage that will be expressed over the radio, on the net, and instant message, you know, and then what action will take place. So this example is a foothold is, is established, the authority to make that call would be the operator, the communication they will put in chat is, you know, have I've ex, you know access established on per, this particular IP and host, and then what's the action? Well, the team lead is notified. But the reason that you um, execute in this particular way is to keep it clean and also to make sure there are no miscommunications. Uh, almost every mission I've been on that, that went sideways, when we take a look at the events as part of that mission that affected the outcome, miscommunication is almost always part of that. So you want to take out as much of that ambiguity as possible and scripting out the communications is a great way to do that. Slide, please. In the top right hand portion of this white space, uh, of this whiteboard space, you're going to see the command and control structure, you know, who's in charge um, and who falls under them so that you know how information will flow and who has the authority to make what calls. Slide, please. And then also the communications plan. So, you know, if, you're familiar, if you're familiar with the acronym of PACE, it was primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency, you want primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary um, forms of communication. You also want to talk about, you know, under what conditions will you roll from one form of communication to another. Brevity terms, call signs, all that stuff should be spelled out as part of the uh, cord card. You also want, you know, what are the deliverables and, and when should they be turned in? Slide, please. The key part of the rock drill events and the contingencies is, you know, the more experienced you become, the more complete this list becomes because you just you you've seen these events happen on mission, and so they tend, you know, there is a there there is a heavy uh, probability that a lot of this has come up in the past. You know, if it's on somebody's checklist someplace. You know, the Marines have a saying that says, you know, checklist items are written in blood. And the reason is because they had they have learned experientially, you know, that you need, you know, to paint the pool handle red or you need to do, you, you need to, you know, put this step in the checklist. And the reason that that, that checklist item is there is because, unfortunately, they, maybe it cost somebody their, some of their life. The reason that most of these events would be on the contingencies or rock drill events uh, portion of the plan is because it's happened out in the field and somebody learned the hard way that it's very important and that it impacted the mission. So that's why they're there. Slide, please. So what you're seeing now is a notional chord card. Again, there's a there tends to be a front and back and it's usually folded in the middle. It's a handy resource. The value really is not in the chord card itself as it is in just making the chord card. Uh, this particular example, you've got your operational objectives in the top left and your tactical objectives um, just off to the right. You've got your time zone reference card just for uh, a reference portion uh, just for quick, um, uh, as a quick resource in case you need it. Your schema maneuver, your any information from your CTO, basically what the mission is, what the daytime group is, uh, who the uh, customer is or the, the, the mission partner, who the uh, what AOR you're going to be operating in, and any mission notes. You've got some additional uh, amplification just below that. You know, this might say mission note one, and then uh, more amplification down here uh, to help uh, provide guidance to the operators. Any key mission POC information here uh, on the on the bottom left hand portion. On the top right hand portion, you're going to see technical operating environment information about the infrastructure itself, or about the target environment. Then uh, below that, you're likely to see uh, the infrastructure lay down or just you know, more helpful information to help you, which typically for troubleshooting. Just below that, you're going to see mission checklist. So that's going to be the pre-mission and post-mission checklist. Again, each of these items, you know, we'll say are written in blood, meaning someone learned the hard way that you need to take these, you know, take step X. So uh, just below that, any pass on notes or any crew notes. Slide, please. On the back side, not uncommon uh, to see time zone conversion charts. I mean, because of the business that we're in, we operate across many different time zones. And so 
It is very helpful to understand you know, where you are at in relation to Zulu time, and because that's likely what the times will be listed uh, in the CTO or the ATO. And that just makes sure that everybody is you know, tracking the same time frames. Then there's the uh, any contracts. The uh, sometimes you know the army sometimes calls this their execution checklist, but this is going to be their criteria, authority, comms, and then the action. Just to the right of that is going to be your Rolodex. Uh, oftentimes, this is going to be names, numbers, primary, secondary, tertiary, so that you can reach uh, reach that person or their alternate. And then oftentimes there'll be a map, some sort of laydown of the mission, you know, the mission space itself, the AOR. Slide, please. 